thanks very much for uh, agreeing to meet with us today to talk a little bit about your campaigns for Portland School Board. Um, I wanted to um, probably just start off with having each of you talk for a few minutes about why you're running, um, why you think you're the best candidate um, for this position. And um, uh, I think probably we'll just start by going in alphabetical order. So um, Julia, if you wouldn't mind starting off. That alphabetical order thing, my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> <laughs> I know, one of these days we should just reverse it. <laughs> Even when I sat in the back of the room, I, like, I got caught by the uh, alphabetical order thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, great, I'll just kick things off. I am Julia Brim Edwards and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to ask for the Oregonians endorsement. Um, and I hope to earn it. So four years ago, uh, the district was a mess. We had the exit of the longtime superintendent due to the lead in the water crisis. Too many students, especially students of color, not getting the support they needed. There was an unsuccessful student uh, superintendent recruitment and pretty much the wholesale departure of senior staff. Discordant dysfunction on the board, a crumbling school infrastructure and dangerous lead asbestos and radon on our buildings and a bond that had been severely miscalculated. Students in middle grades, especially those in outer Southeast and inner Northeast had inequitable experiences and transparency and accountability uh, was low, including the elimination of the internal auditor position and a failure to connect the dots on the decades long uh, mi misconduct by PPS staffer, Mitch Whitehurst. People at the time wondered why I wanted to run. Um, well, as a parent and a PPS alum, I really care deeply about the success of our students and about our public school system. And I knew that we needed um, myself and others who cared about public schools to jump in and get PPS back on track. I was elected to the board in May of 2017 and got to work. Um, working with fellow board members, I led the successful national superintendent recruitment uh, before this and brought the superintendent on board before the start of the school year, brought the board together around a common student focused agenda, funded more academic supports for historically um, underserved students. Uh, we opened two middle schools that first year, Harriet Tubman and Rose, um, Roseway Heights. And um, that led to a thousand students having more equitable middle grades experience. I also demanded more accountability and transparency and added funding into the budget to reinstate the Office of the Internal Performance Auditor, commission the Whitehurst um, investigation, and as, as a result of that, secured changes in the teacher's conduct contract to prevent misconduct records from being removed from files and also created the new adult professional conduct policy. In addition, I played leadership roles um, for the past to get the local option pass, about 900 teachers a year comes out of that, is paid for by that, passing the landmark Student Success Act and chaired the 2020 bond. Um, we also changed the superintendent uh, evaluation in a really fundamental way so that his performance is evaluated based on, in part, on the achievement growth of Black, Native, students of color, special ed students, and emerging language learners. With all that, we really brought PPS back from the brink and we were in the midst of making improvements and investments in instructions and supports um, for our students to improve academic outcomes. And then COVID hit. Um, and I, I will say our teachers, our students and our staff really adapted. It's been a tough and, and challenging year on, on so many levels uh, for our entire school community. And I really want to thank the students and staff and parents for persevering um, through really an unprecedented year. Um, and with that, with COVID happening and uh, pivoting into the recovery, uh, we really have challenging and um, critical work ahead. And I think those fall into two main priority areas. First is COVID recovery. I'm committed to reopening schools safely. Um, and then understanding where, where students are, the gaps and the losses so that we can offer summer school, extended summer learning opportunities and fund, and also fund a fall recovery plan that provides the academic, social and emotional um, supports that students need. And then second, um, as, we, as we make our way out of the, out of the um, through the COVID recovery, we also need to um, recommit and fund to getting all of our students, especially our students of color on track to graduate, to perform at grade level and to find their passion. 
Um, and also, and then to give them the supports to do it. Uh, fortunately, we have the uh, additional funding from the Student Success Act um, and our local option in order to, and the Federal Recovery Act money in order to provide those really crucial supports for our students as, as we move ahead. So um, I've helped lead Portland schools through tough times before and I'm ready to do it again. And I hope to gain the Oregonians editorial endorsement. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, next, uh, we go to Libby. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running and, and why you think voters should be picking you? Um, hi, I'm Libby and I am also a Portland Public Schools alum. My daughter is currently in fifth grade Spanish immersion um, and she's been in the same school since kindergarten. Uh, I'm... <laughs> I'd have to say, you know, this has been a immensely uh, a learning experience that um, with some, you know, an unexpected uh, new knowledge coming. Um, but and I appreciate that, like everything that the school board has been doing, because I know it is not an easy task. Um, I know it's a complicated situation. Um, I graduated in the late 90s. And there was, you know, a lot of transition going on during that time. Um, I find that the adopted equity lens uh, that I greatly appreciate um, PPS taking on, but maybe they're not utilizing the equity lens to the extent that it should be used. Um, many people of color and our parents and our community have expressed that they still don't feel like their voices are being heard that their expectations are the same, that their their voices, you know, um, aren't listened to and that they anticipate neither the board making decisions or the district making decisions without their consent. Um, I think that there's a lot of distrust among parents in regards, especially to the recent um, led remediation that occurred a few years ago. Um, COVID definitely threw a curveball at PPS um, and as it did across the world. Um, and I think they were, you know, responding the best they could, but teachers were lacking adequate um, equipment for teaching. Um, we've, you know, we all just discovered how many people don't have proper uh, communication in terms of, um, especially in regards to having just basic internet, people are lacking that and that made it a challenging situation um, for teachers teaching kids um, and trying to figure out the logistics of that. And that's more complicated for sure for a larger school district of 80 plus schools 50,000 kids. Um, I think my number one goal is uh, if we could actively engage the district, better communication towards parents, towards teachers, towards staff, administrators. I think there's a lot of holes in communications that seems to exist. And this causes a lot of the conflict and problems um, we also experienced the Southeast Guiding Coalition work this year, um, which was possibly brought too much stress to certain parents. Um, they were not you know, able to cope with the issues that COVID brought, but then in addition to the question of, you know, where their children were going to be going to school, et cetera. Um, and I know North, it was part of the process and we we're in there in the timeline because Northeast Portland had already, you know, done their guiding coalition a few years prior. Um, and if there was ways to avoid that, but there seemed to be major communication issues around um, the Southeast Guiding Coalition in terms of even um, hearing from people in the Asian community who expressed frustration that they were finding out information about the potential future of their students' programs through their community newspaper. 
and not from the district. So yeah, for me, number one is communication. Um, I think there needs to be a better focus on um, building maintenance, grounds maintenance, um, possibly just facilities overall. I think there were a lot of facilities cuts that occurred a few, um, a decade plus ago and that those positions were never refilled again. And it's kind of left certain properties that are in PPS's care in disrepair. Um, so yeah, my hope is that I can increase communication for the district between parents and PPS and teachers, because there is a lot of teacher frustration out there as well um, in regards to their employer. Great, thank you very much. Um, Max, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running. Okay, hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity uh, to, to speak with the Oregonian today. Uh, a big reason why I am running is because uh, during the snowstorm in February, uh, you had an article about how to run for, for Portland School Board. And uh, it cost, uh, I think, $10 to, to get on. Um, and during that snowstorm, I really reflected a lot on my experience with uh, PPS. And um, I've been an involved parent. Uh, my daughter is in middle school right now. She's at Roseway Heights. Um, one of the new schools that was opened, but let's be clear here. That school was closed back in the Vicki Phillips era uh, when Julia was first on the board. So it's a, she was at a Vestal and that was a very um, trying time for my family. Uh, and you know, I submitted an article to the Oregonian and you guys published that and I appreciated it. Um, so I've been a very involved parent. Um, I've also been involved in the, uh, DBRAC discussion that uh, Libby was talking about when they were reworking the boundaries. And again, that's a frustrating experience because the solution was clear, but you had to bring everybody together um, when the solution was already there. I wish it would have just uh, gone that way. But the reason I'm running is two main factors. I've read the auditor's report from 2019, very alarming. Uh, the experience is described in that was experienced by my family and numerous families throughout the Portland School District. I did not appreciate or wasn't impressed with the response of the district to the auditor's report. Secondly, the reimagined Portland plan to me is alarming. It is created by a consulting group. We are the only school district in the state um, to have a branded vision plan um, and it's called Reimagine Portland. It was created by Prospect Studio. It's branded right on the plan. Um, and I find that really troubling. And I'm concerned that that is the guiding document because they're working on our strategic plan and our budget. And I look forward to just engaging in the discussion, learning more. And I, again, just wanna thank you again for this opportunity to let my concerns be heard. And I hope to earn uh, your endorsement today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Let's just start off by, I, I wanna get into detail in, ter in terms of everything that you guys have talked about, but um, one of the, the most pressing issues I think right now is uh, the return to in-person instruction. And um, I, I think let's, uh, I'll start off with you Libby and we'll, we'll just kind of um, alternate who goes first um, in answering questions. But I'm wondering if you can talk about um, your view of the plan that the district has um, is putting in place for the return to in, for in-person instruction this year. Um, you know, tell me what, uh, uh, you know, if you're, um, if you feel like it, it's adequately doing what you think it should, if it was too, too soon, if you're, you know, just tell me a little bit more about just, you know, what your reaction is to the plan that was developed. Um, just, yeah, in regards to the, the hybrid learning that the students are participating in currently, or some are participating in some are still lear distance learning. Um, I believe it is adequate for now. I mean, you have to transition somehow. And the fact that the students were, you know, essentially online for the previous school year and the beginning of this school year. Um, I know there was a lot of push, um, you know, especially for the governor to 
you make a declaration that everyone was returning to school. Um, but I was also hearing, you know, from a variety of parents, some had, you know, high anxiety. And so those parents were keeping their kids at home for now um, with anticipation of returning in the fall. Um, my student returned to school. Um, I believe it's important for their social mental health for them to have interaction um, with other kids and that that has been lacking for a lot of the students. And that's an important part, important part of education is to have that socio um, interaction with other students. Um, and yeah, it's more difficult to do in a larger school district, you know, so they, the school district is doing the best they can in terms of, you know, returning for the remainder of this year, which is only a few months. Um, but I anticipate that yes, um, as PPS does, that students will be returning to school full time five days a week next year, for next school year. And I believe, yeah, this is sufficient for now. Um, it's, it's complicated when you have so many students, it's, it's easier for you know, a, a district like North Clackamas to return to you know, school sooner or other smaller school districts. Um, if you had but, been, sorry, just to jump in, if yeah. you had been on the board um, this past year, is there, um, uh, would you have sought a different plan or a different timeline or anything along those lines? Um, I'm not quite sure how the plan came about for the decision for specifically for the time space for just if it had to do with cleaning um, in between AM and PM groups. Um, the two hours and 15 minutes is, is rather short, but I know that, you know, there's other issues such as busing is a major component that some kids, you know, have to use other transportation. And so you have to work around the schedule busing students and spacing. I know spacing is an issue as well in each classroom, how many students they could have um, per classroom. And so for me, yeah, it, may, it makes sense. I think the district, you know, is doing the best it, it could under the circumstances of, um, I wasn't anticipating Governor Brown saying, okay, everyone must go back to school now. Um, I really thought that they were possibly gonna wait till fall, but I do think that is healthy for the kids that they're, that are able to return, to return and ultimately it's for their emotional health that I think it's best. Yeah. And yeah, that the district did the best it could. And I don't know, yeah, I would make a different decision. I know there's just a lot of complicated factors mm -hmm. involved in that decision. Great, thank you. Um, Max, same question for you. Um, you know, what is your assessment of the uh, return to, to hybrid instruction um, this year? And if you had been on the board, um, is there anything different that you would have sought? Um, first off, I want to say thank you to everybody in PPS uh, who's dealt with this uh, COVID uh, epidemic. I've been pleased uh, with how the district uh, especially has responded for my family. Um, and I'm thankful for the teachers, the board, the superintendent, everybody that have guided us through the unprecedented time. Uh, in terms of hybrid for the middle school, um, it's you said in the paper yesterday, it's a glorified study hall. I think that's good maybe for the social aspect of kid, for some kids. My daughter's choosing not to go back um, because she doesn't want to. And I think if you're trying to build social interaction for the middle school kids, maybe just open up the outside of the school and let them gather there. But I'm not gonna uh, parse uh, what the board's doing. I think they've done a good job. Uh, this is coming up from high above and we're transitioning slowly. I'm hoping that while we, I'm not sure if the fall will be able to operate at full capacity. Um, so are we gonna have some of this uh, comprehensive distance learning? I have an introverted daughter. This is the first year, honestly, that she's really liked school. And as a tutor doing it online um, and working with the kids, I've seen some positives with it. Absolutely no families need it and it has to get back open. But there's been some really good things that have come out of the comprehensive distance learning. And I think that's a reflection 
of the hard work that the teachers and the school has done. Um, so in terms of things I would do differently, I've watched them. I think they've done a great job. And I'm appreciative of the fact that they're hiring social workers to help kids transition back as well. So um, that's my response to that question. Great, thank you. Um, Julia, you were on the board and you, um, uh, you, know, you voted for the, the agreement with the Portland Association of Teachers that kind of helped um, put a framework on, on the return to hybrid instruction. Is there anything, um, I, I guess, you know, can you, there have been criticisms that for instance, on the middle school and the high school level, it's a glorified study, study hall. Um, you know, can you talk about why you voted for this and why you think that this is the best path despite, you know, criticism some people may have? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think of my 20 years of working with the public schools, this is probably, you know, this is an unprecedented year. I mean, all around the country and, and the globe. Um, whoops, sorry. Everybody's uh, sort of wrestling with this. Um, we decided early on to, you know, follow the science, um, to prioritize the health and safety of our um, students and staff. Um, also, we prioritize um, parent choice. And I think this conversation is probably a, a great example of, um, you know, every parent has to make the decision of what's best for their for their child. And so for some, um, comprehensive distance learning was the best way to end the school year. For others, students really needed to get back and be in class and have that in-person interaction because that's the way they, they learn best. Um, and, you know, I, I um, went to the first day back for um, elementary students and, it's, it's amazing. Our students are, and staff are so resilient and adaptive because like within a half an hour of them walking through the school door, students were in their classrooms, learning, engaging with their teachers. I mean, it was like such a happy, I mean, the students were so happy and so were the teachers to be um, gathered together and learning. I mean, the biggest thing is like everybody had masks on and we're just farther apart than normal. Um, you know, and for the middle and high schools um, students, I think um, we don't we, we don't know yet um, because today actually I'm missing the reopening um, of high schools this afternoon, um, and then the middle schools also are reopening for hybrid. And you know, I think what I found is that. Um, PPS is a learning organization, and throughout the pandemic, we've um, we've learned a lot, and I think we've tried to adapt those the, those learnings and provide the most basic supports for our students. We've you know provided over three million meals, tens of thousands of devices, and wireless um, and Wi-Fi for our students who didn't have it. Um, we've got lots of teachers who are, um, despite there being resistance to mandating it. A lot of teachers are doing simulcast. Um, this morning I saw a teacher uh, talking to um, the five students who were in CDL, the first graders that were in CDL who chose to still be, um, be learning from home and but still being part of the classroom. Um, so we're seeing teachers adapt um, as we um, and, and, and students and and their families adapt to, um, you know, it's just a totally unprecedented environment. Um, I, I will say the, the one thing that, um, for, so in, in terms of the high schools and middle schools, um, the district staff and um, school principals that I've talked to have been clear, it's not going to be a glorified study hall. Um, but again, we need, um, students to get back into their classroom, into their classes um, to, to find that out. I certainly will be interested in watching what's happening at the high school and the middle school level. Um, the one thing I, you know, still, um, I was really torn about voting for a plan that included the six, that still had a six feet in it, even though that at the time that we voted on it was the, the standard. Um, but shortly thereafter it changed. And, um, but I did feel that we needed to get our students and our staff back at least in a hybrid environment for some in-person learning so that we could adapt and be ready for this, this fall. Uh, but overall, I think um, we've had staff, school staff, central office staff working incredibly hard this year to, you know, run a school system with 50,000 students um, 
you know, virtually. There was a huge pivot last last March. Thank you. Um, Max, I think you go first on this next question. Um, okay. uh, undeniably, there has been a significant um, loss of learning over the course of the year of, of CDL, that, that kids aren't where they would have been had there been in-person learning all year long. Um, I'm curious what would, uh, what you think that the district would do or what would you do as a board member, either in terms of um, uh, advocating for um, programs to address that, metrics to measure it, um, any innovations that look at how to tackle that loss of learning, um, you know, if you were elected? Wow. Uh, well, it's going to be a team effort, uh, first off, but uh, we have a huge problem in the district before the pandemic. We have the largest achievement gap in the state. Uh, we have to address things. Uh, standardized testing is one part of it, but that isn't how I would measure when the kids are coming back. We have to make sure they have the services. Uh, if you want to be innovative, you have created this comprehensive distance learning program. Uh, that can be give kids access to services that they may not have been able to have before in the classroom. So there's all sorts of ways to innovate to make up the gap. The teachers are gonna work with the kids and see where they are uh, in terms of learning losses and things. I can't say that as a board member, uh, what I know their learning losses are, um, but when to measure that because it's they're not doing standardized testing right now in the spring and I agree with that, just given the fact that we're transitioning to a hybrid model. But yeah, you have to be innovative in how um, you're going to make up those losses. Can you do some online learning in the classroom when they're in schools? Uh, some so kids can get specialists there, you know, on site, but they'll be virtually, you know, at school. Um, find out what those needs are, um, and I think the teachers will have ideas on how to make up those learning losses as well. I know that the district's considering some summer school. Um, I, you're gonna have to ask parents too what they would like. The only communication I've gotten from the district, this goes to what Libby was saying, was uh, is your child interested in coming back for a hybrid model? And what's your opinion on what we're renaming uh, Madison High School? Those are the big district communications that I've received. Uh, so I think it's gonna take, uh, you're gonna have to do a needs assessment of what the parents and students see uh, their need is, what the teachers are seeing and uh, make sure they have those services available to them. Uh, and then if there are extra money that's coming in from federal emergency loans, let's direct that into uh, some summer school programs that are targeted for kids that we think are at high risk and that will actually use the service. So it's gonna be um, a lot of um, assessment, seeing what services we have available and then targeting those resources is um, my general reaction and view on that matter. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Julia, same question for you. Um, just kind of recognizing that there has been a, a loss of learning and um, uh, in what students have been getting through CDL. Um, you know, what would you hope to push for or advocate for um, if reelected to address, measure, uh, you know, come up with different innovations that would kind of help close that? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. So I would say that up until this morning, there's been this singular focus on <laughs> we've got to um, launch hybrid for middle school and high schools um, as from, from an external perspective. And um, internally, there's been a lot of work done in terms of the budget and securing resources so that we can address um, the learning losses and the gaps that have that have happened. Um, so sometimes it may not be a learning loss. It may be there was just a gap. There was a gap in instruction. So you know, identifying what where those are and the meeting kids um, where they are. And I think um, we we do have data. Um, we have certainly a teacher's assessment of where students are, and we have um, also the. Um, assessments that we did throughout the, the year earlier, the maps, and we're, there's going to be a presentation um, later this spring on um, sort of where our students are, and I think that should help us focus our focus our um, investments and our resources um, to really target them on the places where um, we we see either gaps or losses. Um, I do know that the district has put out an RFP for summer safety and enrichment um, about for like $10 million 
in um, asking our community-based uh, partners to um, come up with innovative programs to um, both provide summer enrichment and also extended learning opportunities. Um, so I'm really going to be excited. I think the the deadline for that is May 10th um, to see what our community partners who are really close to our students and families. Um, and then next fall, um, we just also got the superintendent's budget. Um, this last week is making sure that our resources are targeted in those areas in which um, really prioritizing the students who either saw the biggest gaps or learning losses or were most impacted by um, by the by COVID and like it's not, not just COVID, but also the economic um, impacts that this has had on many of the, the families of students where they've lost sort of just base, basic uh, economic supports for their households. And um, so my hope is this 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 budget. Um, and again, the board will consider this what's been proposed by the superintendent. But this board this budget focuses on. Um, both new and existing supports for our students to get them back on track and accelerate them. Great, thank you. Um, Libby, same question for you. Um, I guess what as a board member would you want to do to kind of uh, help address the loss of learning that's taken place? Um, well, I think continuing to yeah, seek additional funding is a good idea because in my mind, Oregon has underfunded education, not just Portland, but Oregon in general has underfunded education and that there's the potential for greater funding out there with some legislation changes. Um, I thought it was interesting during uh, the in, in between the, the lip use of Lippy, uh, which was, you know, for targeted students so identified by specialists and their teachers for additional help. And I believe that some parents were, you know, um, that I spoke with were under the impression that, you know, it would be good to continue that type of program on a regular basis, um, which I'd have to say I agree. Um, the specialists I've worked with uh, at our school are amazing. Uh, my daughter qualified three years ago for special assistance for learning disabilities. And I'm very grateful to them because they have, you know, helped her immensely. And I hope that every child in Portland Public Schools at every school is receiving the same type of attention that she did because it's immensely helpful for overall education to, you know, to see that progress and, um, occur and yeah it's you know she's uh, fortunate that she comes from a home that you know she has two educated parents um, that have graduate degrees and not every child has that opportunity and like Julia said like some kids are more limited by their economic status unfortunately that you know they are not receiving the same type of help so I hope that we can continue to, yeah, utilize our specialists, maybe invest in, in having more specialists for the district as well. Um, I know that, you know, the psychologists are, are busy. They usually are doing double duty. They have multiple schools they're working for. So they have, you know, lots of students on their caseload, so to speak. And the specialists are working around the clock as well. But I, I've definitely seen it, you know, work to the advantage of the student. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're back to you, Julia. Um, we've seen over the past year a community-wide understanding of the need to change institutions and practices that contribute to systemic racism. What are the specific changes you would seek to help fulfill that goal at PPS? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. Um, so when we um, hired our new superintendent um, and committed as a board to be student focused and to be laser focused on black native and students of color, we um, did, did several things as a board. Probably the most important was we shifted, um, well, 
two things. Um, we focused our resources and additional funding that we received to provide additional resources in schools that supported um, students of color and historically underserved students. Um, and those that that those resources came in the sort in the form of um, equity funding and also um, additional staff to provide instructional and counseling support uh, for students. In addition, um, we also um, when the Student Success Act passed um, used uh, designated that money for. Um, to support our community-based partners who provide culturally appropriate supports for our students and our families. And also we, um, to get the district staff laser focused on these students um, was we uh, picked some indicators that we felt um, were important um, measurements or metrics to um, that we wanted to see an increase in both student growth and also uh, performance. Um, the performance um, of students of, for example, our black students um, reading at, at grade level or our, um, Native American students um, is, you know, in the low teens um, in some places um, in the single digits and that's completely unacceptable. And we created a, an evaluation template uh, for the superintendent that our expectation is that his, his, the, his people, the school staff and um, the school, school district's resources are to be focused on um, driving both growth and um, an at an accelerated rate, both growth and performance uh, for those students. And um, as we pivot out of COVID, um, continuing that work and keeping our both both our COVID resources, but also the district's resources on those students. Thank you. Um, I think this now goes to Libby. Um, can you talk about just um, if if you're elected, how you would um, any specific uh, initiatives or programs you would seek that address uh, systemic racism uh, practices or um, uh, uh, other aspects of uh, systemic racism within PPS? Um, yeah, I think you know, access access can differ depending on yeah what community you live in, what part of town you live in, uh, the the condition of your school, your you know your fellow students around you. Um, there's definitely been severe cultural divides within Portland for a long time that have been you know probably you know coming out of the the 1920s and. Um, the redlining that occurred with real estate um, assisted in that problem. And moving forward, I think we need to start thinking out of the box. We need to have more interaction with more community engagement with uh, communities that are more uh, affected by systemic racism. Um, we're not, I don't believe we're engaging enough with them. Um, I think, you know, if we could hold community forums um, you know, I thought possibly even by zone, uh, because it's some, you know, even within zones of, of how Portland is broken up, you know, for district, um, you might have like, you know, one school that has a total different um, support system. And a lot of that, you know, some of that exterior support is coming from parental fundraising. And there is like a big push to reform the PPS um, foundation um, because at one point it was, you know, basically, you know, buying teachers in one, you know, in a specific scenario. Um, so yeah, we're not, it's not, it's the footing's not equal. Um, <laughs> we still have to figure out, you know, why are the test scores the lowest and the highest in the same districts in some years. And that is a fundamental problem. So it's like, how are, why are we treating some, why are some schools getting, you know, better treatment or able to have access to purchase additional teachers? 
or even, you know, the ability to buy um, field trips. Like I know, you know, in our, in our situation at my school, we are spending out, you know, 14,000 a year when we were able to have field trips. But Lent school, for example, Lent school, you know, it, it, it's fun money. It was like a couple thousand dollars that they had available. And it's a school that's not very far from us. But Is it's like they don't have the same parental base to raise money. And so is there something specific that you could see um, advocating for as a board member to, to kind of even that out? Well, yeah, I would say, yeah, the foundation, you know, definitely needs to be reformed 100%. Um, some people want to abolish it altogether. Um, but if they find that, you know, this is something that's beneficial to the district to maybe keep on using it, but to reform it. Um, but again, like, I think do we do need to access additional funding. Um, for me, I believe that, you know, the, the cannabis tax, a lot of the money goes to poli policing. And it was like the way it was set up, whereas some of that, those, some of those funds could be redirected to education. And I believe they should be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But yeah, so more community engagement with the communities that have, you know, not been un traditionally un underrepresented and their voices need to be heard. Great, thank you. Um, Max, do you want me to repeat the question? It's basically just, you know, what you would- Yes, specifically. you can repeat the question. Just sure, so. um, basically over the past year, we've seen just a community-wide acknowledgement of the need to address uh, some of the practices and institutions that have uh, uh, contributed to systemic racism. And I'm just wondering as a board member, if there's anything specific you have in mind um, that you would want the district to focus or uh, ideas you have to, to help yeah. address that. Okay, yeah, lots of ideas. Um, <laughs> uh, first off, we have to acknowledge the problem. We have the largest achievement gap in the state. There's a remedy for it. Uh, the auditor's report lays out some ideas on how to tackle it. S overall, um, when you enter a Portland public school, I feel like it's always, here. what's wrong with you? What's going on? What's wrong? And I feel like when you enter school, it should be what's expected of you. And we need to have a standard of excellence and equity and have some good expectations for our students. Yes, we have an achievement gap. This is how it's impacting our whole entire community. Let's create a strategy like every other district except ours, where we say, here's our problem, here's our goal. Um, and I really urge uh, Portland voters to look at our strategic plan. You don't have to be an auditor to compare it to every other district and they diagnose the issues. They're dealing with the same problems as Portland, but they're doing a better job of creating some equity. So we need to understand that uh, to, we have to own the fact that we have the largest achievement gap in this state. We have to hire more black teachers. We have to state that we are very low. We are under um, the state average. And I know this is a statewide problem, but it's also a Portland problem. Why can't we keep um, black teachers? Why are we unable to recruit them? How is the equity office working with human resources to fix that issue? And we have to be really explicit with what we wanna do. And then if you want to get into just the practices of the way uh, school board meetings are run, the way PTAs are run, there's a lot of inherent systemic racism within that. Uh, but I think overall, if the district states the problem, sets a goal of excellence, um, we can remedy a lot of those um, problems. Uh, but I don't think it's being communicated clearly uh, to the public. Um, what a big gap we have. And is your view that there is that there there aren't goals set for uh, decreasing the achievement gap or uh, improving uh, percentage? Uh, you can go there. There's a little three page three goals that the board has. But if you read the um, superintendent's strategic plan, yeah, no, there's no plan. If you read the whole vision, 52 pages, 52 pages of a vision for a school district. The words reading, math, and science show up, I think, grand total of five times. 
it's not doing the school part. You can't solve the equity problem if kids can't read and can't do math, you, especially if they can't read. And we've got to fix that. And I think it's just being clear and straightforward with the people uh, and the board of saying, hey, you have all these ideas, but the board I view is to be the people's voice to a clear narrative of what the district's trying to accomplish. And I've taken a deep dive into the PPS website and read so many different materials. And I don't know what the clear goal of the district is. What are they trying to accomplish and what direct steps are they taking to close this equity gap? Um, I think you get a lot of um, celebratory verbiage, but not a lot of real action. And that's what's frustrating as a parent and um, as a taxpayer. So Julia, as a current board member, um, you know, what is your response? I mean, do you, are there specific enough goals, do you think, for the board? Or what is, um, uh, I, I guess, the, the vision that the board um, is uh, insist or laying out for the superintendent to, to achieve? Yeah, I, um, I guess maybe Max, you haven't looked deep enough on the website because there is the um, the goals that the that the board set out, um, and they are focused on Black Indigenous students of color. Um, right here, um, and um, we're starting to make make the investments in. Um, in changing the trajectory of our students and being laser focused and holding the superintendent accountable because that is who is um, in our governance system supposed to lead that work. Um, I will say there's two other um, things that I think are um, that I didn't mention before that will um, help PPS uh, be a um, more socially just and racial and racially equitable equitable district. And um, one of them is one that Max raised. Um, I believe that we do need to do a better job. And this is something that both Michelle, Director uh, Michelle DePass and I have talked about the last two superintendent evaluation cycles is that the district um, has done a disappointing job in recruiting and retaining Black both teachers and administrators. We have a, a number of excellent black administrators, principals um, and leaders who have left for other districts. And we need those students, students, we need, I'm sorry, we need those leaders because students need to see both teachers and leaders and principals that look like them. And that is absolutely something that I'm gonna continue to, um, elevate in the in the public eye and also when we evaluate the superintendent um, have that be one of my my metrics um, the third thing is um, there's a reason i'm supporting um, gary hollands and herman green in the, the other school board seats um, because i believe that having more diverse representation on the school board will help us make better decisions. So when I've served on the school board in 2001 to 2005, um, it was the last time there were three people of color on the board. And we made, I think, better decisions. And because we had different perspective, different lived experiences. And I believe that um, in addition to um, Gary and Herman on the board, in addition to um, Director Michelle DePass, that um, we'll, we'll be doing the work to um, show students that um, we're going to elevate them and that we are going to use um, in all of our decisions, our racial equity lens. And I do think representation matters. And I've tried to be a good ally of Michelle on the board, um, which is why I have her endorsement. I have the endorsement of the last only person of color on the board, Julia Sparza Brown, um, as well as lots of other community leaders. And um, I think it is, we're going to have to do it all. We're going to have to do it together, not just um, the board by itself, the superintendent, um, but all of us together. Thank you. Um... I think Libby, actually, this question, uh, let's start off with you. And what do you see as being the job or role of a board member? Um, can you, if you can talk about just what, um, uh, what you would focus on as a board member, um, what you see as the board member's role, and what would be your approach towards doing it? 
Well, I think you're you're acting as the the guide for the entire district. The decisions you make affect the district directly. I mean, you are sort of two separate entities, but at the same time, you you are acting as the guide. You're the one who's hiring the superintendent. Um, and you, you know, essentially you're making decisions, yeah, that, you know, can affect students for, you know, decades. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. I, do, I agree with what Julia says. It's, you know, it's important. It, it involves working together. Um, I don't know, like, how the fragmentation has happened over, <laughs> over the past, um, but I think it's, you know, the past isn't important. I think what's important is, you know, how are we going to move into the future? Um, because we are yeah, starting to, you know, lag behind. Um, and yeah, I think public education is important or I wouldn't be you know, running for school board. Um, I do think that there needs to be more, as I said prior, there needs to be more community input. Um, the last in-person school board meeting I attended, I was very frustrated when I left because I didn't feel like the board had listened to the individuals that were getting up to speak to them from the community. Um, they were asking for something very specific, um, which was only a delay of a vote. But um, it seemed to be the board's consensus that they, you know, there were other reasons that they wanted to move forward with the vote that evening, but they didn't care what the community members were saying to them. And I didn't understand why the board was not listening to person after person who stood up and asked simply for a delay of a vote. Um, and I, you know, and maybe in my head that's, you know, started for, you know, formulating thoughts about like, well, why, why is this? Why is it that, you know, the community members who are willing to spend their time, their free time to engage with you and, you know, aren't being listened to. And I think listening is very, listening is as important as being able to speak well. Thank you. Um, Max, um, what do you see as being the role and responsibility of a board member? And I guess, how would you go about uh, filling that? Uh, for instance, what are some of the, um, uh, I, I guess, the values that would um, shape your leadership on the board? Okay, um, well, uh, openness, humor, humility, um, ability to uh, work with others are the values that um, I would bring um, into the board accountability as well. Um, and I think that um, has been missing. Uh, I think uh, what Libby was saying about, you know, we can't, we have to move on from the past. We can because so many, my whole block is suffering from choices that uh, the board made back in 2001 and 2005. Nobody on my block goes to the neighborhood school. Some go outside the district. I've lost so many friends and families who have left the city or have enrolled their kids in private schools because they feel like it's a disservice for the district. And also, I think the lottery system in terms of literally your kid's education, if you want to get into an immersion program, we're saying play, you can do lottery. We're leaving it up to chance. And I just think that's inherently a flawed problem. And so my daughter, while some people get language immersion, has never had a Spanish class. You can't have that. I think there's an all or nothing with the district and it's really gonna take somebody who's willing to say, we have to think very differently and set some clear goals uh, for the superintendent and have some clear boundaries, really clear boundaries. Like we have a lobbyist right now on the board when we had, you know, with the negative um, audit, she took a role, you know, in denouncing it. And then when the new secretary of state, a Republican came in, she went into that office and this is all reported in your paper. And I just think there's a boundary and an ethical standard that um, I would maintain. And I think I'm there to serve the community. You're there to oversee 
the superintendent, provide him clear direction, help set policy and budget, and um, listen to the community and advocate for our students. And that's my number one job is to be an advocate and um, responsible board member. And I think uh, that's what I would bring. And um, I think we need to move in a new direction. And I think I offer that instead of a dozen years or more of the same. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to respond to that. Actually, um, yes, because, you can answer the question about because, uh, role. Well, I'll, I answered the question about the role, but I just want to answer Max's question. Um, so first of all, I'm not a lobbyist. And second, um, the individuals who left the Secretary of State's office- You're registered as a lobbyist. You, you I, were a lobbyist. Not, you are okay. a lobbyist. And you're director okay, of can global you, affairs. Can you, can, you let me, can you let me finish? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so but, the individuals, okay, let me finish. The, you, okay. I let you speak without interrupting you, so please don't interrupt me. So uh, the Secretary of State came in, as every new Secretary of State does, they bring, for, there's a number of political appointments, she brought in her own people, I didn't work for her, just for the record, and I never was going to. And the, the people that are in the, the auditor's office, I've worked with them, I have a productive working relationships with them. And the fact that I'm the only candidate in this race who's been endorsed by Gary Blackmer, who is the one person in state history who has been the elected city auditor, the elected county auditor, and the chief auditor in the Secretary of State's office tells you something about the level of accountability and my um, passion for and insistence that PPS have a strong auditing function. And I believed Dennis Richardson used that audit the way he rolled it out was political. It was not that I disagreed with many of the findings. I disagreed with the way in which he used it as a weapon against the district. And, and none of those people who were in the political office of the Secretary of State, not the Audits Division, but the political people in the Secretary of State's office, not one of them has done one thing for PPS students ever. And I have spent 30 years committing my, you know, all my free time and my volunteer work to make PPS a better place. But I'm not afraid of accountability for myself or for the district. But I, I do oppose just using an audit to politically try and damage the school district or for his own political purposes, which is what he did. But I don't, I didn't um, object to the audit. And I had, I've worked very closely with Scott Learn, who was the auditor who did the audit. So I think we need to put that to, to, to rest. And as the chair of the audit committee, we have periodically in our meetings asked the district and required them to say what they've been, what, how they have responded to the findings of the, of the audit. And, to, to, and the, the board also had some responsibilities and we've, we're following through on those and we have followed through on them. There has been, I saw the board follow up and you have the Excel sheet lay, laying out this 26 recommendations from the auditor. And there's been, it hasn't been filled in since um, December, 2019. Uh, you, you, you must have missed the board meeting in which the staff, you must have missed the board meeting in which the staff okay. um, work on I'm looking the recommendations. At the it's been resent to the auditors. I'd be happy to send it to you, Max. That would be great because I'm looking at the website and I see the Excel sheet in terms of the recommendations and the response. That's what I have as a citizen. Okay, I'll send it to you after this meeting so you can see what they've done. And Appreciate I agree, the PPS can do better and I'm going to hold the staff accountable for places where we've come up short. One of them being the rotation of, of, of principals in high poverty schools. Um, we are pretty much at the end of the hour. Um, uh, I did want to, uh, Julia, if you are able to just kind of quickly address the um, role of a board member, but I, I guess more- um, Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. No I got caught up and- <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm, I'm more- We interested actually had a conversation. <laughs> I mean, this was actually a really good, I mean, this is, we like to see some of this. Um, granted, we don't, you know, want it to be the entire hour, but I think it's uh, helpful for us. Um, yeah, I can answer that question good. probably in 30 seconds if you want me to. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the role of the board, um, hire and oversee the superintendent. I've, you know, I've done that. 
Um, and I do hold, I, I ask the tough questions and I do hold the superintendent and senior leadership um, accountable for uh, district actions. Uh, we're also a policy making bo um, body. I have, during my tenure on the board, um, written many policies that have addressed um, big issues uh, facing the district. Um, this is sort of our legislating um, work that we're supposed to do. For example, as I referenced earlier, the adult professional conduct uh, policy, which is um, when we looked around the country, there's not another one like it. Um, you also approve the budget and make adjustments um, the board can offer amendments and make adjustments to the budget if they don't agree with what the superintendents propose. And I've done that in the past. Um, I've voted against specific items. Um, and I've also advocated for things like when the superintendent tried to cut PE and adaptive PE. Um, I believe every student <laughs> deserves that. I was a you know, um, total, I went to school for PE when I was in elementary at Glencoe. And, you know, some, some students, thanks Libby, me too. Um, some students, uh, it's music, others is PE. So, you know, when I, the superintendent has proposed things, um, I've drawn a line in the sand or we need to, to do more or less of something. I've made, off, you know, offered amendments. Um, we're also community representatives um, and I think I do a good job. I've been in every school in the district uh, some multiple times. Um, we also, one of our main, um, one of our main um, responsibilities is a, a little um, sort of in somewhat intangible, but it's really to, it's just holding the, the district accountable for our work. And I think if you watch board meetings, I ask tough questions. I ask the most questions. I'm sort of, I'm a, I'm a skeptic. Um, you know, we, we have, Essentially, the board has three employees. One is the superintendent and then the two auditors in the office of the independent auditors um, office. And, you know, it's our job um, through our oversight to um, provide both transparency and accountability for the whole district. And, you know, frankly, since 2017, when the district was at, I think, its lowest point probably in two decades, um, we have come a long way back. And we, and we have, I will acknowledge, we have a ways to go, especially as how we um, how we educate um, students of color and special ed students and emerging language learners. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for making time to be with us, or me, um, us in uh, the grand scheme. Um, this was a really helpful conversation um, and very thoughtful. Um, so I appreciate all your time and uh, the fact that you all are running. Um, we'll be coming out with our endorsements on Wednesday, April 28th. If you haven't already sent me your photo, please do, as well as your age. Um, but uh, we'll be in touch if we have any more follow-up questions. Um, but again, thank you so much. It was great talking with you. Thank you. It was great meeting everyone.